Praise the Lord. What a great opportunity to thank the, the house, the management, especially Pastor and the deacons and elders for this great opportunity to teach. I'm not taking this opportunity for granted at all. Uh, when I was playing the keyboard, so many things were going on in the around the It looks like the church is so many. It's really heavy. A lot of people are bending in the church. But one thing that I'll assure you of that the Bible says that when the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. So don't be wanted at all. I know that by the closing of the service, you go home with good job. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn under your feet. You pray that the Holy Spirit can teach us. So you said that when you go, you will set a comforter and teach us to us. Let that teacher come and take absolute control. Explain things to us to be understood the way that you want it, not by our human understanding, not by our education, but the spiritual understanding. That the emperor and an opportunity in Jesus and the third country in the name. Amen. Okay. So last week, who can remind us of what we learned last week? Just one person. What we learned last week. Okay, that's nice. Thank you. That's so last week we learned about socialization, and one thing that I picked out of it is how we distinguish the the world view of socialization from the Christian view. And one of the strong examples is when we were warning us that don't be equally you and equally you with unbelievers in terms of marriage. So just that marriage starts from relationship before it goes. Up and after you marry. So that's one thing that I really learned from it. So today we are coming to learn another topic Christianity and governance. Let me ask him. Christianity and governance. And I'm sorry, my way of teaching will be different. They'll be using slides, PowerPoints. Yes. And <clears throat> Christianity and governance. So please, uh, technical thing, one thing I'll be, it's good, like, my memory verse, uh, my Bible reading will be from the Message Bible. Message the Message Bible. Bible. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, so when we talk about Christianity and governance, what comes into my So the introduction, the outline, we are going to talk about the introduction of what is Christianity in a nutshell, and what is governance, then God's view, God's view about Christianity and governance, what governance God takes governance for and also why Christians should be involved in governance. So we'll be talking about God's view on earthly governance and why Christians should be involved in governance and uh, a Christ-like governance and the conclusion. In the Christ-like governance, I would like to talk about two characters. So as time goes on, you will decide further. So the memory, our memory verse is taken from Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. And we want to take our first Bible reading from Romans chapter 13, from verse 1 to 6. It's the message Bible. Yeah, so the Bible is saying, be a good citizen. All governments are under God. In so far as there is peace and order, it's God's order. So live responsibly as a citizen. If you are irresponsible to the state, then you are irresponsible with God. And God will hold you responsible for that. 
the only constituted authorities are only a threat with the only constituted authorities are only a threat if you are trying to get by get by with something so one thing we have to know is that that means there will be bad people in authority too because the the bible is telling us that duly constituted authority so that means there are some authorities that will not be duly constituted maybe the ones that break election and they are into power so what do you think about that what if there are bad people in governance and there are certain rules that are that do not come with our faith and our faith frowns on that what are we going to do are we going back to consider what happens to Daniel when he was in Babylon, when Nebuchadnezzar set up a golden god that all of them should bow to it, or what are we going to do? Maybe as time goes on, we will answer that. So Christ has called believers onto a life of influence, control, and dominion. And if you read that, you can get that from Psalm 8, verse 6. We are the light of the world and we are demanded to explore darkness. So the Bible says that we are the light of the world. So wherever we are, that means there is no darkness. When you read the book of John, the chapter 1, the Bible says that a light shines into the darkness and the darkness comprehended is not. So if we are the light and we are in authority, that means the light will take away the darkness. Right? Are we good? Yes. 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 So we are to take up leadership roles and exert Christ-like influence in our niche. So wherever we find ourselves, when we are talking about government or governance, let our mind not go on maybe His Excellency Mr. Ahmed Bolatin who no. <laughs> we, are, we are going too far. Let's bring it to where our jurisdiction, our place. Maybe in this church, you see we have the technical team, they might be ahead over there. So you are governing the rest of the people that are under you, you are controlling them. And when you come to the music department, the music departments have their head over there. And so there are people under you, and so that is governance. You are ruling them, but not in a bad way. Now, it's Christianity and governance. So I want us, one thing we need to know is what is Christianity at all? What is what comes into mind when you hear the word Christianity? <coughs> Please can anyone answer? Yeah. Christianity is a religion that is okay. Christianity is a religion that the only sound good. Okay, thank you. So, anyone? Christianity means when, a, when we serve the only true God that come and Jesus and died for us on the cross. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, let's give it up to them. Yeah, so. Uh, in a nutshell, the way I understood Christianity, I would like us to read some, take some Bible readings. And so the first thing that comes into mind when we talk about Christianity is one of the commandments that God gave us. And that will be seen in the book of Mark chapter 12, verse 30 to 31. Yes, can we have it? So, so love the Lord God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. So that is to me. And here is the second one. Here is the second one. Love others as well as you love yourself. There is no other commandment that runs these things. So when you talk about Christianity to me, me, I see it as something that Christ-like. And what is being Christ-like is to love your God <coughs> as your personal Savior and Lord. That is the basis of Christianity. And what at all is love, when you are talking about love, is this that emotional feelings that come when we meet our opposite sex on the way? Is that the love that God is talking about? Or which love are we talking about? So I would like us to get the definition of that love from the Bible. So we will get it from the book of 1 Corinthians 
chapter 13, verse 3 to 7. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3 to 7. So when we understand this love, we will know if we really love God, if we are really Christ-like, or we are pretending to be Christ-like. So if I give everything I own to the poor, and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no, so no matter what I say, what I believe and what I do, I am bankrupt without love. So now love will come, the definition of the love that we are talking about. So love never gives up. These are the, the qualities of the love that the Bible is saying we should love. We should have as Christians. So this is the basis of Christianity. If we don't have this, then we have mixed it. So love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't struggle. Love doesn't have a sword head. So when we talk about, when we take all these things and you ask yourself, are you really a Christian? From my point of view, if we should ask ourselves and see, check ourselves, does this love of God, the love that God is expecting us to love him and also love our neighbors, love the one sitting beside you, love our, our children, love our friends, love everyone beside us, love every human being walking on earth. Does these things grow in life? Is it really in earth? So if you do a retrospection of your life that you are living as a Christian, from the day you declare the Lord as your personal Savior and Lord, are you really sure that you are a Christian? That is one thing we should be asking ourselves. So to me, that is Christianity. And one thing I know is that Christianity is not about barriers and or about hierarchy. When I'm talking about barriers, I'm talking about someone coming there, okay, I am the senior prophet. So let's say our pastor is saying he is the senior pastor of the church, then the rest are different. So that that's, that is creating a barrier among us. So we see that some people we see some people making statements. We can be age mates, but we are not grace mates. <laughs> I don't know where they get that thing from. We can be age mates. We can do everything. We can be in the same class, but we are not grace mates. So that is creating barrier in Christianity. Is that what God wants us to do as Christians or what? Is it about hierarchy? So I put some picture over there. Yeah, so I hierarchy, uh, the organization. So you see that someone is at the top, then at the down someone comes. So it's not like pastor is the head, let's come, let's say Christianity, when you are talking about Christianity, then for example, pastor Ephraim is the head in terms of Christianity. Then comes junior pastors. Then now, departmental heads come, then members come under them. <laughs> no, that is not Christianity. You see that our world these days, Christianity is being misinterpreted, everything is misconstrued, and everything is just going its way. The worldly understanding of Christianity. One thing I know about Christianity is about love, and the love has its qualities. If you should retrospect on yourself, have a deep, retrospection, you, you will know if you are truly a Christian or not. Then we go on to governance. And so governance is governance is an active concept related with efficient and effective exercising of authority, usually legitimate. So we are not talking about people that forcefully went into leadership. Some people just want to go into leadership just because they want to pursue their, their selfish ambitions at the detriment of others. So it's not about that. Authority usually legitimate to regulate the affairs of men in a given territory. So it's not only about the maybe a country where we see the president over there. That's not only what governance means, but when we take governance to its core understanding, it's just about governance is basically about ruling leadership or having dominion in particular niche and taking charge. So when you read about governance, you know some people, we, we have some ideas, some Christians, they say that, ah, 
when it is voting time like this, that's the most important one. When it is voting time, then you see Christians saying that, ah, me, I'm not going to go to this leader. They just come and spend our money anyhow. I don't want to even try it. So they should just go and do their own thing. I don't know. So, and Plato has this thing to say. He said, if you if you don't take an interest in the affairs of your government, then you are doomed to live under the rule of fools. So, you know, when there's leadership and, you know, the head is there, then the followers are, are there. Then you are making, you are excluding yourself out of that organization. They are doing voting, they are doing, they are submitting ideas on how to handle issues, and you are just taking yourself out, thinking you are the smart person, you are really a fool. Yeah, so that's what Plato has to say. So, governance is servanthood, serving the people you are governing, having the people's interests at heart. So, Governance is, is just about leadership. So if you don't have people's interest at heart, then that is not governance. You are, you are just there for your parochial interest. Nothing more, nothing less about that. So one of the Bible verses that will come into mind when we talk about governance is when Prophet Elijah was prophesying about Jesus Christ in Isaiah 9 verse 6, and he was saying that, Unto rest a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. So, one man, when I was reading and preparing, one man called Justin Matai was having, um, actually projected something that that thing really came to pass. And when we talk about government, it's about servanthood. And he compared it to when Jesus Christ was going on the cross, and he carried the cross on his shoulders, the government on his shoulders. So, is, and that cross meant the sin of the people. That is the burden of the people he was carrying. So Jesus Christ was having the people at heart to liberate them. He's doing everything possible to liberate them and serving the interests of the people. And that, that prophecy that came from Prophet Elijah was having an imagery re, uh, reality when Jesus Christ was going on the cross, when he carried the cross on the shoulders. So we go. So God's view on governance. Technical, please, can you help me with the slide? So God's view on governance said, governance is instituted by God. He is the ultimate governor. And so there are a lot of Bible readings, and I don't want to go because the time is really short. So governance is one of the purpose of creation. So when you read the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 31, you know that that is the purpose, one of the purpose God created us is to have dominion. And he says that he has created and then you have dominion over the bears of the air, the fishes in the sea, and everything that creeps on the land. So that is the one of the purpose why God created us, to govern the rest of the things that he created. Have you ever thought why God created us to have dominion over the rest of his creation? Have you ever sat and just sit down, just thinking, ah, why is it that God didn't create us without brains that we can also be like the zombie animals? Just so when God says, hey, stand at this, then you stop. You do everything. But God created us to be to have leadership and dominion over the rest of his creation. So born or called to lead. So being made in God's image means we were created to lead. When you see God, God is the ultimate governor. He created everything in his own time and he rules the whole world. So and the Bible says that God has created man in his own image. In his own image, he created man and woman. So God created us. If we are in his image, then that means he has created us to lead. So God commanded both male and female to have dominion. Governance is not gender specific. We are not talking about men being in position that women are far back. I really hate that. I'm not talking about women coming up in, uh, in community and say, we are the head men should go and sit down. What men can do, we can do it and do it better. No, I'll give you something. Can you do it? Come and carry it. You can do it. You can sit down. Somewhere. But the truth is, we should also give women the power. Governance or leadership is not about only men. When God created us, God created women and men, and he said we should have dominion. The Bible didn't say that men should have dominion, even over females. So that's one thing we have to know when you are talking about governance. Then 
We are to rule over the earth, but not necessarily over each other. When you read the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 31, you will know that God didn't create us to rule over each other. God didn't say that we should rule over our friends, we should rule over our colleagues. The Bible said that we should rule over the birds in the air, the sea in the water, uh, the, the fishes in the water, than anything that creeps on the land. That is what the Bible says. The Bible then says that we should rule our friends or our colleagues. The only thing that will make you think you are ruling is that maybe you are having a specific gift that is of benefit to your friend. In that case, you are leading that one. Do you get it? So it's not like you are coming to rule them. Then all of us are to serve one another in the area of our gifting and purpose. When we discover our gift, we will naturally lead in those areas where we are most productive. So, you know, governance is also a tool for orderliness and sanity. So, you want to read that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. 1 Corinthians. So, this is when Paul wrote a letter, the first letter to the people in Corinth. They were really the church is really confused because everyone is interested in prophecy. I'm speaking in tongues, so respect me, hear me. Everyone is just doing their own thing. And Paul was addressing them, no, that is not how it should be. Even if you speak in tongues and you prophesy with your tongues, someone should be there to interpret it. So it looks like the people of Corinth at some point in their Christianity, they are all interested in who speaks in tongues. So instead of speaking in tongues to glorify or edify themselves, they are speaking in tongues just to satisfy themselves. So today I spoke in tongues. You didn't speak up your boss. <laughs> so the Corinthians were actually abusing their gifts and calling and calling attention to themselves instead of gratifying Jesus Christ in their worship. So that's why Paul wrote to them. So if you read the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, and you go to 40, the early part says, let everything be done in order. Let everything be done in order. And that is what Cap Dance is about. Leadership. Setting things, setting your priorities right, making the right at the right time, and setting things in order. So, technical, please slide. So you see that when you climb up in leadership as a Christian, Slide. So I put some triangle over there. So when you climb up in leadership, right decreases and right decreases as you climb towards leadership. So when you are in the church and you are going through a, a, a higher leadership position, you realize that the base is there. And when you are starting, you have the right. You can say, you know, say, Pastor, leave me, let me tell them my mind. I have the right. But you realize that as you are going in Christianity and you are going up, you see that your, your right is decreasing. You are now caring about the responsibility of people. Whether they do it or not, you just leave everything to God as a Christian. I'm not saying you should just leave them so that everyone can just walk on you. No. But it's not about right any longer that I have my right. When pastor is saying that, you're like, no, 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 pastor, I have my right. I should tell them my mind and go. And responsibility. So, it, responsibilities increases as you climb towards the leadership. So, you see the triangle. You are going from the apex, the thin part. When you are going, your responsibility increases as governance. In true government, when you are going up in government, you are moving from one place. Let's say you are moving from a prayer leader to be uh, the head of the prayer department. And you are now becoming a junior pastor to the senior pastor. When the senior pastors are around and listening. You know that your responsibility increases, not your right. Your right will decrease and your responsibilities will increase. So why, Christ, why is it that Christians should be involved in governance? One, it's part of our inherent responsibilities as believers. That's why one of the things, Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, the Bible says he created us to have dominion over everything that he created. And it's to effect positive and lasting change. You know, when we are in 
power as Christian. I'm not talking about Christians that are appearing to be Christian. No, people that are deceiving themselves Christian. If you are truly a Christian, you realize that you put in rules, like how Paul was telling the church that let everything be done in order. It's not putting anything in place that the church will be in chaos. No, it's trying to set the, the priorities of the church right and do everything in the orderly manner. So good governance makes a nation to stand out among nations. So when you read Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, you see that. Then to make righteous laws and decrease that leads to national progress. So a Christ-like governance. So this one thing I introduced into my teaching today that was not part of the book. So I want us to look about two people in the two characters in the Bible. And these two characters, I, I really want us to take two different characters. And I want us to examine something. What really aspired them to be in position? What really aspired, uh, inspired them? Then the second thing we have to think about in these two people's life is the cascade of events that happened during their governors or prior to getting there, what really is making them to take that governor, to take that leadership role. And the third thing that we should know about these two people is what is their end, what is the result? What is the result of their pursuit for leadership? So the first person I would like to talk about is Nehemiah. So when you read the book of Nehemiah, you realize that Nehemiah is just a cup bearer to a king, King Atazazis, and this to be a cup bearer is a, a position of influence. You will serve the wine to the king. And at some point, you have the opportunity to taste it first before the king says it. In terms of poison, then you will die. <laughs> so Nehemiah was in that position. And it's a position of trust because the king has to trust you. Otherwise, you just poison the king one day and the, the king will just die. So that is the position of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah saw a need, rose up, captured a vision, a vision, laid a plan, and mobilized others to join in his cause. That's the whole thing when you read the book of Nehemiah. So the first one that we want to identify over there is uh, Nehemiah identifies a problem or a need. So when you read chapter uh, Nehemiah 1, technical please, Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 3, you realize that Nehemiah actually had the people of God at heart. So they told me, the Ezra survivors who are left there in the province are in bad shape, conditions, and there is appalling. The wall of Jerusalem is still rebuilt. The city gates are still in plunder, like the city gates are not there, everything is gone. So Nehemiah worked, when you read, when you come down, Nehemiah worked about that and went to God. God, what should I do? That is a sign of good governance, sign of good leadership. He's taking a position and he's having the people at heart. So as a Christian believer, that is one thing we should do that. When we are taking positions, not only in the church, but in the world, we should have the people at heart. Can you imagine how the world will be if the people in government are really, really and truly Christ-like? Can you imagine it? We have a lot. And I really, that's why I tell, I tell my friend, when you check statistics in Africa, we the Christians are many. We go to government, government the priest. So I want the development of Africa to be equated to the percentage of Christianity. But it doesn't match. Why are we really Christians? <coughs> then the second point is Nehemiah call for action. So you read the first thing that he did was prayers. Then the second thing that he did under that thing is encouragement and empowerment so a good leader will encourage the followers when he steps into so i want to do this but i need people to do it with me so he gets people and encourage them this is my plan you get along with me and we do it so when you read the book of nehemiah chapter 2 verse 17 to 18 he encouraged the people to get into his course to achieve whatever he wants to achieve the third point is teamwork, and he defended his work against enemies through prayers. When Sambalat and Tobiah were working and mocking, mock, uh, mocking them, he didn't only pray, but he set people at vantage points so that they will, they will, like whatever they are doing, they will protect it so that when those people send people, they can defend. So you realize when you read at some point, he sent people, including children, female. 
They, they didn't just pray and sit down that God would come and fight for them. No. They set strategic points. And at the end, you realize that the world was completed. So when the world was, it's in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15 to 16. Technical. Nehemiah 6, verse 15 to 16. So the world was finished on the 20th, 25th day of Elo. It had taken uh, 52 days. The, uh, verse 16. So when all our enemies heard the news and all the surrounding nations saw it, our enemies totally lost their nerve. They knew that God was behind this work. So you realize that a good leadership always, when he encounters a problem in the course or in the course of his leadership, you go back to God. God, what am I doing? As a Christ-like, we are not teaching governance in isolation of Christianity. No, we are teaching it in Christianity. As a Christian, what should you do if you're in that leadership position? What are you going to do? So you realize that in all of the process that Nehemiah took, Nehemiah will always go to God, then taking an action. So you always know that he's having the backing of God, even in mobilizing resources. Nehemiah is not a rich person to come and go and buy the timber and everything. But because his position as a carpenter and having favor really helped him to have favor before the king, and the king funded everything through friends, writing later to other countries to supply those things to build the land. Nehemiah, the Bible didn't say Nehemiah was a prophet going around to prophesy or heal anyone. No, but he achieved a great thing that God is happy about through leadership, good leadership and wisdom. So the second person I would love to talk about is Absalom. Mm -hmm. So I was reading the book and the Bible didn't report anything significant about Absalom apart from his handsomeness. Mm. So a whole man, the Bible, the good thing recorded about him is that he was very, very handsome in the whole Jerusalem. From head to toe, there was no blemish. Can you imagine the crashes that he were have? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Absalom was the, man, was the man of the land. Was the man of the land. Very handsome, <laughs> very, very handsome, and a prince. And one thing that shocked me was that the father of Absalom is a king, that was King David, and the grandfather, that's the mother's father, was also a king. So he's not a cheap person. Both hand is coming from somewhere, the lineage is everything is good, everything is everything that is at his disposal. But the Bible couldn't record anything about leadership trade. Maybe he has gotten it from the father or from the mothers, nothing like that. The two major things, episodes that the Bible record about Absalom was the revenge. And everything is bad, it's about murder. It's to revenge for the sister Tama. It's, uh, uh, Absalom is having a brother named Amnon, and this Amnon is really crashing on Tama. And Tama is a sister to Absalom, and Tama too was very, very beautiful. It looks like that woman is having a good seat. All the children. The, the mother of Absalom is Maka. And you know, all the, the two, like Absalom and Tama, they were all recorded as very beautiful and very nice in good shape. So Amnon, that is the half brother to Absalom, different mother, was really having taste for uh, uh, Tama. And he couldn't resist it, so he has to think. Because Tama was a virgin, Amnon, Amnon has to engineer means of getting him into getting her into the room, and he eventually had his way and just finished him. Then after that, the Bible says that he had a hatred, serious hatred for Tama, to the extent that the love he has for him is even less than if we compare to the quantity of love. He was having for the lady is not it's just more than the hatred the hatred built up because whatever he was doing he was looking for he want he got it already and that is serious last so Absalom was waiting for king david to avenge that to do something about it but king david didn't do anything about it you know when you read one of the bad side of king david was the love for the children the love is really bad so he's having a serious love for 
And so he couldn't do anything. So three years down the line, that thing was still in Absalom. And he now got some party, and everyone went there, all the kids men, they went there. And he now ordered the soldiers to kill Amnon. That's how he revenged over the, the sister, the sister's rape. Then later on, after doing that, he knew it was a bad thing he did. And he ran away to the grandfather's side, stayed there for another three years. Then David now has can David now have mercy on him to come back. So for him to come back was a starting point for another episode, a conspiracy against his own father, the most handsome person that was recorded in the Bible, is having this. So you're from one scene to another, you've done something, your father was not happy about it, you were away out of Jerusalem for three years. For you to come back is another static, another plot again. So the Bible says that he stayed at the gates. So one thing you know about Absalom is that he started with the propaganda. You can people who come with their problem. He, he he appears to be the person that will solve it. Can you imagine? Oh, Pastor, or maybe Pastor Bola comes to me and I'm there. You can't see the king. So I'm there. No, Pastor Bola. Can you imagine if I'm the king? I will really help you in this issue. Mm. So that is what he was doing for all the people. And he stole the heart of the people. So that was a propaganda, like propaganda, what we see in the in the world today happening. See that one government comes, they are saying bad about this person just to win power. They are not doing it on the basis of truth. They are just doing it just to get into office. And now that after that, they will win the heart of the people. Then they get it. That's their, their way. So he said he wins. The second thing you know that I'm not going to win the heart of the people through lies. Lies. He conspired against his own father. His own father, and he wanted to get into leadership, he wants to be a king. But look at the way he was going. He started with the propaganda, lying, deceiving, saying negative things about his own father's governance. Is that how Christians should go into governance? Is that how a Christian should live his leadership life? No, absolutely no. Then the next thing that was shocking for me that I learned in Second Samuel chapter 15. Verse 10 was that I'm not uh, Absalom actually sent people around to go and sound trumpet, and he told the people when they sound trumpet, they should glorify his name that Amnon is uh, uh, Absalom is the king. I say Jesu. <laughs> I was shocked. So self glorification. You see that everything he was doing, every every episode from one strategy to another was a strategy just but you want he just wants to be there what are your leadership skills have you gone through the process no he's not caring about that his own thing is i want to be on the throne whether the at the detriment of others to the extent that he's even having army he has lured the father's best counselor Ahitophel, to join him is that the kind of leadership that the bible expects us to live no so the last thing about the tragic thing about all this is propaganda, lies, and all those events, episodes of events is death. He just died. So you know that the ending is very bad. Very, very bad. So I'm going to, in conclusion, I want you to ask yourself, go inside yourself and ask, are you a Nehemiah type of leader or you are an absolute type of leader? If you are not into leadership position now, God has created us to be leaders. One day you may see yourself in that in that position. Are you really going to be an are you going to exhibit the traits of Absalom or you are going to exhibit the traits of Nehemiah in governance? Uh, believers must use their God-given gift to decide the destiny of their society, territory, and nation at large, and turn this world to the kingdom of our God which is God's divine mandate for us. Thank you very much. This is the first time we see somebody teaching us on this life. This is beyond illustration. This is beyond sound. I said earlier, the younger generation are taking things better than the older generation. Youth, 
Le docteur Asselet, je sais, nous on a des collègues professeurs. We have learned so much. If I were you, I would vote for that slide. Don't let us think about that leadership in the place of governance alone. Do you not experience for the leaders of your home? As a father, as a mother, you are a leader over the children. What are we teaching them? Is it a Nehemiah kind of, kind of leadership or an Absalom type of leadership? Absalom's everything about selfishness. And something held that stood so much for me. May we never offend somebody that will not forgive us. Amen. Yeah. Amnon did it as the first child, as the first son of David. Absalom refused to forgive him. He did not walk. He did not hurt at the time it was up. What did he do? He waited for when things had died down. Even Amnon talks that it has happened, it has come. That was when he stuck. If you say we don't forgive, we don't offend anybody, we are deceiving ourselves. Can we never offend someone that will never forgive us? Amen. People think about today's teaching. Christianity and the governance. Thank you so much, young man. And at this level, young youth, you shall be coming up to teach. Can you ask? Please go down. Can you all rise up? With an example is one of the ones, one of the youths that is coming to teach us. You want to use them as a point of contact or hold of them. Don't stretch your hands to him. And just bless him. Just as parents, just you know, pronounce that word of blessing. Oh, and use him as a point of contact to all our youths, all our children. That they will know God better. The hand of God will be over them. They will be good examples for their generations. They will not just be speaking the word. They will act the word. They will act the word. They will be living examples. Good examples. Blessings will come to their parents through them. People will say, blessed be the work that bore them. We pray for all you youths. You shall be greater than us. In the name of Jesus. You will not fall, you will not fall. That every youth will pray for you. You are the joy of witness, and you shall be the joy of the Lord. The Lord help you. These words you are spoken will not stand like this. Any one of you, you will not fail God in Jesus' mighty name. Let's tap our hands together. And say, I know you didn't ask for questions. Anybody have any question? Let's sit down with one. Just one minute, two minutes. Does anybody have a question you want to ask it? God bless you, man. Please ask the question. Please, I don't have a fast time because you have to give place for questions. Yes, for all the questions. Okay. I want to ask if it's possible for a Christian to go into the governance or to rule in the, in the public and not to compromise. Because we actually had cases where Christians go to rule or to leadership. And yet they couldn't function, probably in the midst of all what is going on around there, and they're able to compromise. Is it possible for Christians not to compromise their faith? Good man. Those Bible says those that do not answer quickly, one minute. Those that know their God shall be strong and be great experience. It is always very tempting. It's always very tempting. I remember those days that we have a we have a man that became born again. Very born again, very chronic one, but he was working in the oil sector. And in those days, we have to bribe for us to get fuel. So when we go to the temple, before he used to take bribe, before he gives us fuel. So when he became born again, so we don't give him bribe again. But he started working in the midst of people that were mocking him. After some time, he did it for about three years. He could not continue. So when you bring bride, he will tell you, just put it there. He's able to come by it. 
So you we need many of us we to stand is difficult, but it is possible, man. Hello, man. It is possible. It is very, very possible. You will see some Christians, they will say, instead of I taking it, I'll resign the job. And the, most of them, they do resign the job. And God is always a faithful rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You never stand with God and God will disappoint you. The next place they will hear you, they will hear you higher than where they are. But it's always a very tempting position for you to say, I, I cannot join them. So the best thing is for you to say, I am designed the work. And God will always stand by you. Anybody have another one? Praise the Lord. Please, there is no time. But I need to say something. Very, very powerful question. And Daddy has done it justice today. But let me say something. Uh, I know people who resign actually, but it did not solve the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. When the wicked rule, the people languishes. The solution to that is that we need more of believers in that position. In that position, in governance. When we have ten parliament, ten people in the parliament, five are Christians, five are unbelievers. If five stands, they make the right decisions. When you have one out of ten, it is insignificant. So the lesson today. Encourages us to go into governance, politics, so as we can make effective change Amen. in our nation. Thank you very much. And don't leave the governance of the country alone. In your place of work, take positions. Stand for God. And when you see Christians there, encourage them to come up with you. When you do that, it will not be only you alone. There will be many voices that will support you. Am I making a point? Yeah, yeah. May we get there in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Encourage our children. I want to come here one day and say, My bride, this that comes from this church. Yeah. It, is, it is possible. Yeah. Hallelujah. It is possible. And you are not too old to get there, sir. You are not too old to get there, man. Let's have our mindset change. That place belongs to us. When the righteous rule, the nations enjoy. But when the wicked rule, the nation perishes. They will not perish. Don't bless you, man of God. I hope that answers all the questions. Let's see if our question you can send it. You can ask your questions. We'll post it to him and we'll send replies because of time. Let's have the choir for the hymn and the praise and worship. Amen. Hallelujah.
Understand the simple, but I let your world be lit at night. Let your world be on vision. Let your world heal up. As I speak, Father, Lord, put your oxygen in me and give the listeners the ear to hear your word. They shall not only receive, but they shall do them. So shall it be in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we are praying. Amen. Now we turn to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter twenty-eight. Chapter twenty-eight, verse twenty. Twenty-eight, verse twenty. It is a month of open heaven, divine visitation, and good news. And this is what God is telling you and me this morning. God says, He said, The Lord shall open unto thee His good treasure, Amen. the heaven, to give the rain unto the land in the season, and to bless all the work of thy hand. And that shall lend unto many nations, Amen. and thou shalt not bury. Verse 13. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, Amen. and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. Amen. If thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command this day to observe and to do them. One thing is clear when God opens his heaven, rain will come. And when it comes, abundance come. And when abundance come, overflow come. And when there's an overflow, every drought is cancelled. And that prophet happened this morning. He said, I will bless the work of your heart. That means where you are going to every morning to get your daily bread. I prophesied this morning, as you go there on Monday, you shall be prosperous. Amen. You shall be fruitful. Amen. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let me tell you this. This morning, I bring you a topic and title, The Principle of Honor. The Principle of Honor. It's a principle that most people have neglected and have worked against it. If you look at Genesis 8.22, the kingdom principle is very clear. For every harvest that is a seed, it's not, it is fraudulent. It's a scam. For you to expect an open heaven when you did not sow a seed. That's what it is a scam. It is a scam. It's a fraud. Serious work. Praise the Lord. So, God said, there is seed time, there is harvest time. Some are weak. There are others available. But your harvest will only come when you sow a seed. Your heaven will only open this month when you sow a seed. And this month, we shall be looking at the seed of honor. Whenever you sow a seed of honor, doors open. All failures are ability to me. All failures is traced to one dishonor. True or false? And all success is traced to honor. And then by ask yourself, why is it that the door got opened before? Now begin to close in front of you. Check yourself. When every door closes, if you check your 
life. There is a trait of dishonor. Honor opens. Honor magnifies. Whatsoever you honor, we magnify your hand. And whatsoever you dishonor, we diminish your hand. Praise the Lord. Now the question is, what is honor? People will not look at honor as respect, high esteem, fantastic. But I define honor like this. I said it is the discerning. You must discern where, how, where to honor. I said it is the discerning, comma, celebration, comma, rewarding of excellence, comma, usefulness and of value. When you are recognized, when you have seen, when you have noticed, when you have acknowledged, you say, yes, let me reward this. Let me celebrate this person. Let me reward this man. Let me reward this woman. Let me reward this son. Let me reward this daughter. Praise the Lord. There was a story of the Shulamite woman. Listen to me. Remember that story? In the book of Second Kings, we might not read it because of time. He said that was a Shunammite woman in Second Kings. Yes. Proverbs 4. They said Elisha was a prophet. And he normally passed by the way. But the time came, the Shunammite woman perceived. She was able to discern that yet. This man passing every day is a man of God. What did he do? He said, let me honor this man. I told the old man, they prepared bed, prepared breakfast, and they invited the man of God, and he tarried in the house. You know what honor did for her? He said, what can I do for him? This man said, he has no child. And that I said, yes. This woman has honored me as she has no child, it cannot happen. The man of God prayed and he prophesied by the new moon, you shall have a child. And what happened? She conceived and she gave birth. But what happened there? He said she perceived, she discerned, she, she recognized that this is a man of God and decided to honor him. And what happened? Her breakthrough. Okay. When you struggle, when you discover this principle of honor, you will struggle no more in Jesus' name. Yeah. So now, the question you ask yourself is who are you to honor? We run too quickly. We didn't have no time. Who are you to honor? So that you will know when, how, where you will honor. I said, number one is God. First Samuel 2, verse 30, quickly. Then you can think quickly. Let's run through this. First Samuel 2 verse 30. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that the, the house and the house of their father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord said, Be it far from me, for them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me, that means that means God deserves our honor. Anytime you despise God in any way, you will be far from Him. It's the month of open heavens. And we are crying, let heaven's opulence fall. Then we never fall until you give God his honor. Can I tell you this? God does not answer any prayer in dishonor. The only prayer God answers in dishonor is the prayer of God, repentance and brokenness. Every other prayer is near before God. Can you hear that? The prayer of God answer in dishonor is the prayer of God. Repentance and brokenness. Every other prayer in dishonor is a short heaven. And God does not forget this principle. It's a strong principle. Can I tell you this? In the book of Genesis 16 from verse 9. The principle of God does not violate. I will never violate it the prophet is far. He said, at the end of the Lord said unto her, return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And what happened? Verse 10. At the end of the Lord said unto 
her, I will multiply the seed exceedingly. That it shall not be number for multiple. Do you know what happened here? That it will be very simple. Because the issue of Sarah and Ruth Hagar. Sarah told the maid Hagar, come and live with my husband and give my husband a child. And when she conceived, oh my God, this child, she became a rebel. She no longer respect her boss, Sarah. She became so proud. And Sarah asked God, I mean, asked her husband, Abraham, what shall I do? Abraham said, it's your maid, deal with her as you visit. Sarah said, okay, I don't want to do. Sarah really dealt with her and the woman flee. And when she fled, God, let me tell you something, God then called every account to heaven. And God said that angel, as the angel met her, he said, hi God, what is the problem? He said, you what? Sarah has done to me. He said, do you know what? Do you know what? There is a principle you have violated. And there is the principle of honor. Before I will bless you, go back to your boss, which is Sarah. Subject yourself unto her. After you do that, I will multiply you. You can never escape the law of honor and be prepared to be blessed. It's not possible. And that's what he did. And she went back. If they not gone back, she'll be far from honor. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And look at number two. People you must respect, you must respect men and women of God. First Thessalonians 5 12 13. We have respect that we have established that you must honor God. Number one. And number two. The other way you must respect is men and women of God. First Thessalonians 5 from verse 12. Yes, quickly. First Thessalonians 5, he said, I will beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. To do what? To know them. To recognize them. Praise the Lord. To honor them. The men of God who labor over you, who are going to be in war. God says you should honor them. Can I tell you this? Anywhere you are worshiping, listen to me. It is dangerous to remain in that place you are worshiping. And you criticize on justly the men of God preside the people with the world every day in that place. You are violent people of honor. You'll be there for 100 years. You can never be blessed. Praise the Lord. God said you should know them and recognize them. It's better to leave that place, go to another place. You must recognize and admonish the men of God that preside over you. You must honor them. Honor them with prayer. Honor them with anything at all. But honor them. What you have this day, we have people that worship in the ministry. They take the man of God down, they dress him down. Take the wife, they dress him down. Can I tell you this? So we say, oh, I love the man of God, but I hate the wife. Let me tell you this. It was only Jesus Christ and the church. You cannot know the man of God over the ministry and you hate the wife. You are dishonoring him as well. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I remember I went back. Somebody would come and tell me, Father Zach, is this, is this, I love. And you are seeing in the ministry. You demean and cheapen the servant of God who labor over you day and night. Can I tell you this? I was not discovered that in ministry. Do you know what happened? People don't get blessed, many people. But people from outside, strangers, receive their blessings. You know what? I will tell you this. I remember I went back. My pastor is a group of people on the phone and they get their blessings. If you go to outside, people will receive their blessings. People will visit the ministry once and they get blessed. And people have been there for years, they never get blessed. And everybody said, 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 the prophet, that honor, said, this will come to Familiarity is the mother of this honor. Just like Honor is the mother of favor. Familiarity is the mother of what? Dishonor. You become so used to the prophet in your ministry. 
you begin to chip in, you begin to disrespect him. It might not be in his face. But do this, no. Do that, no. Do this, no. But before we come from our side, any instruction of the family, and I pray to come. Miracle is obedience to the word of God. Whatever he tells you, do it. Praise the Lord. So, all know is powerful. He said, people you should respect is those with authority. Romans 31. Let me tell you this. Whosoever is in authority, be the pagan, be the Muslim, be the Christian, it's all your business. Are you hearing me? God said, those in power, what do you do? All not them. Now let me speak to you. Put that at work. You want to ascend promotion in your office. And what do you do? You have never honored the manager in that place. Even your line manager, your supervisor. You communicate dishonor in your speech. You communicate dishonor in gossip. You communicate dishonor in all manner of things you can think of. How do you say the boss is a reason? Does not like me. Because of my color. All from your speech to totality that communicating word dishonor. Be careful. Can I also shock you? All men are going to say, Pastor says something. The bring of question has a good that never that never forgive. Psalm 8 4. David said, Who is man that you are mindful of? All men are not the same. What I will tolerate? The manager of office might not tolerate it yes, and give you sack letter. Be careful. So you must all know somebody in authority. Not only his office, but the person himself. Praise the Lord if you want to do. Don't dread them. The manager is wicked. This is that, is that. And you begin to be a rebel. You have blocked your road to promotion. You have blocked your road to success. You will never go. But whatever you will say, there will be a response in the heavens. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If he's wicked, keep on saying it. You become a wicked man to you. Praise the Lord. I present him where I'm walking. The person that brought me left. So he said, the, the, the new guy is wicked with that, with that. But I begin to communicate honor. Honor, honor, honor. I did my duty three days and I was doing my things honorably. I honored the man. I honored him. People were surprised. He said, he became my friend. I don't say I, I, I don't get from him. Honor, honor, honor. It's a big virtue. Honor is a virtue which you have to pursue. And God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Then again, is this. I accept the those in authority. Then the, the other one I, I want to say here is your spouses. First Peter 3 5 to 7. First Peter 3 5 to 7. Let's read that thing back to seven. It's very clear. Okay. He said, For after this man the old time, the only women also who trusted God and not the same peace so under their husband. Yes, go to verse 6. He said, If I still have been Abraham calling him Lord, who thought that? Okay, go to verse 7. Likewise, you husband, dwell with them according to knowledge. Give you honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as be held together. Of the grace of life that the prayers be not what be hinder. Listen to me. Every story of divorce, the United Kingdom, in Africa, globally, is traced to what dishonor. Every successful marriage is traced to honor, and every unsuccessful marriage is traced to dishonor. Where we are coming, the stories were many. In the UK, in the UK, be careful, marriage is that, that, that. I said to you that. You know what? Most marriages, before coming to the UK, they're already on life support. <laughs> 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 it's not the environment. No! I don't want to agree. They're already on what? Life support. The moment they get there, when does it take is removed, they collapse. Bring honor to your marriage. You walk. 
Bring this honor to your marriage. Whether it be the most village in Africa, it will go down. Honor is powerful. In the church, honor the men of God at home, honor your spouse. Then, for the children here, draw me by 16. Very simple. If you honor your parents. But we live in a world where the youth want to show maturity. They show maturity with one thing, which is dishonor. I'm talking to you, listen to me. I'll be that again. You don't show maturity by manifesting dishonor. Remember Noah? What happened? They said he was naked. And you see, one of the children, they were laughing or two. But what comes this for nakedness? And what happened? Where was he was sleeping? How did he know? God recognizes this principle. And Noah said to one of them, He said, You shall be what? Servant of servant of servant. He, 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 he put a curse on the one that mocked him. That, that mocked him. And his life was ever good. But the youth here, yeah, don't show maturity by communicating this honor to your parents. Mm. Now, did yourself no good. The one that they said now, they say, oh, you know, African parents, oh, this is an African mother self. This is an African father self. They call us old school. But let me tell you this. We may be old school, but the principle of honor has never changed. Yes, sir. When you violate it, you suffer. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I go on and on. Because of time, let me tell you this. Peace to honor. Number one is forbearance. What did I say? Forbearance. Ephesians 4, verse 2. Apostle Paul said, not suffering a word forbearance. I can begin to ask myself, what is forbearing? It's not forgiveness that do different things. Praise the Lord. Forbearing means the person will do it over and over and over and over and over again. You are married here, they will know what is forbearance. It means your wife will offend you over and over and over and over. You ought not to do what? Offend you over and over and over. You have to do what? You have to forbear. What, what did I say? You have to do what? For, that is forbearance. Not just not. Keep on offending you. Keep, you have to forbear. Anyone that cannot forbear cannot honor. Praise the Lord. In your office, if you cannot forbear, you cannot honor. As I said, all men are different. Be careful. If you cannot forbear your colleague in the office, don't be surprised that your colleague may have the key to the open heavens. And you begin to avoid the person in the office, begin to avoid the begin to avoid that. God cannot tolerate. God by doing something you need in the hands of Daniel Colin and you will suffer. You've been a member for 30 years, no promotion. People come tomorrow to get promotion. Be careful. So forbearance is one key you need to use when you are talking about honor. Then look at Esther. That's how you must discern. Honor is very important. I mean, discerning. So going back, honor, you must have the ability to do what? To discern, to perceive. Remember, remember the story of Esther, Mordecai, and Hammer. Hammer went there to exterminate all the Jews. Then Mordecai told Esther, This is what is happening. They prayed and they prayed. But you know what it tells me that story? Mm. Esther said, My king, I have a petition. Mm. But before he made that petition, do you know what happened? He requested the king to be vatted and a hammer to a banquet of wine. I call it a wicked banquet. <laughs> he has to honor the husband first before he can present the petition. He honor the husband to a banquet. He do not honor me. What do you call that? You will decide what you perceive. If you don't decide what to honor, you will go at this. Mm. He decide very well. Yes! My husband, I want to take a go. Let me honor you. Let me back with yourself, back with your wife. He yelled that you have my dress very well. Yeah. You know what happened because of time? 
And what happened? That was it. The, and, and, and now they get his wisdom. He was all of his wisdom. He said, Book of Esther, with Vashati. What happened? He was so proud. Come, come, I said, No, 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 no. How this honor cost her a question, a position, and it was transferred to Esther. Consequences of this honor so many. So you honor in wisdom, you honor in forbearance. Let me also tell you this as a writing dog. I'm 47 seconds. I was a man of God. Big man of God. It is a no working for him and the wife. <coughs> and the Bible I pray for people, they built cars, they built houses. For him, this is no working. But later, the wife perceived that that was a problem. Now the time came, seven was going on. The wife left the church. People were surprised. Mama, 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 mama. What is happening? He didn't talk to anybody. She went home. And when she got home, she was cooking. The husband couldn't wait for the meeting to church. He was surprised. What was the problem? The husband cooking after the church service, he went home. Because the wife, what did the wife say? No problem. Then the woman cooked deliciously. The woman brought her the place. You know, there's a place you keep all God's visitors. You keep the heaven with the holies of holy. You keep those things there. She brought them out. Who are you keeping them for? Honor your husband with those things. You might rather you pray, you go this and everything. You serve your husband with the, with the golden plate, the golden spoon and everything. Correct. After eating, he told the husband, pray for me. The man now decided to pray for the wife, not because he's the wife. He said, this woman. <laughs> And bestow God mercy. <laughs> Can I tell you this? The dimension you see a man is the dimension you receive from. The husband was the was the pastor of the church. Yeah, he was the friend. Uh, uh, he was the husband. But over a time, he was seeing the husband as just a husband. But the day you perceive that this man is not just my husband. That this man is a pastor. And the man prayed for her on that dimension. The rest is this. Every man can a grace. Every man can a treasure. Every man you saw the road, my grace is different from your own. If you relate with me as a friend, you get my friend person. You relate as a pastor, any dimension you came from a man, that is what you get. Praise the Lord. Yeah. What a friend for you today. As you depart here, learn this principle. Go home, honor your wife. Go to your office, honor your boss. Go to your mother, honor her. Go to your friends, honor her. Every success I repeat is just to honor. Yes, sir. And every failure is just to dishonor. When you practice this, this month of open heavens, I'm open for you. Doors will open. Father, Lord, I pray for all these ones here. Father, bless them beyond measure. Amen. Give them the grace to do your work. Amen. Give them the grace to honor one another. Amen. But at this moment of open heavens, let our heaven be open. Amen. Visit them with good news. Amen. So shall it be in Jesus' name. Amen, amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. God's a mighty God. God say, mighty God, as I always say, let us rise up. Much has been given, much needs to be replaced by. We're going to ask the man of God to kneel down. Whereby, if you have been blessed, if the word come for you, why don't you rise up and just release back to him? That God reveal the man of God. Begin to pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. We want to say it's a blessing to have your son in our midst. Lord, your son has emptied himself. Lord, we ask that you refill him back beyond what he has given in the name of Jesus. And Bible says you will never lack, sir. We pray for you, you will never lack much. Us, hey, you shall be sharper and sharper. And the words will you shall convict souls and bring souls to God. We ask, oh God, sir, your oil will never be used up in the name of Jesus. 
your voice will never be used up in the name of Jesus. More and more, increase and increase in the name of Jesus. You will be more valuable to God, winning souls to God, taking directions from God, and your heaven will continually be open. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying them. Amen and amen and amen. God bless. Let's jam our hands together for God. Hallelujah. Let's put this down. Please, I the offering sister, the book is coming for the announcement. I we are going to quickly tell you this. Hallelujah. God bless you, everyone. Uh, can you see we have people with words in our midst? We have people that God has positioned to give us words. Uh, and we are still underutilizing them. We are really underutilizing them. Can you see? You only have here their words and words a month. So we are thinking, we are still working on this. Should we turn our services to two services? Uh, can you see? We are still underutilizing this place. I will give us to go and think about it. Bring the hands up next month. So that we have the morning services, we have another service. Many of us, we are always managing ourselves. And some people will say, you know, the church is filled. I don't want to go to church again. I will be strong. So, if you want two services, let us know. Let us know. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask Brother Wale to come forward. Uh, Brother Wale, I know he doesn't want it. And that's why I didn't announce it. Can you rise up? And we're going to pray for him and pray for the family. He lost his dad last week. Last week. Um, but I think you know him very well. He's a teacher of the world. He's a teacher of the world. So I did announce it on the night, so I know you run away. You just want to use him as a point of contact. That's what's guys of the whole church as a point of contact. Daddy is 87. You don't want him to go. Yes. But we want to use him to pray for the family. And daddy has come to be the Lord, a man of God. You saw mommy. Mommy came here some time ago. You could have saw mommy for that one is more. Also a pastor. So you just want to stretch your hands to him. And say so we pray for the family that the Lord will keep you, the Lord will provide for you. When the time comes that you're making all arrangements, it shall be about God. It will be the Alpha, it will be Omega. I we want to pray for mommy. That is the movie that he has left behind. That God will strengthen mommy. We want to pray for everyone of the family. Many of us know Sister Lai, it's all Sister Lai, but I used to be the children's teacher, his brother, one is junior sister. We want to use them as a point of contact to pray for the shoulder boss that the Lord will uphold them. Let's begin to pray for them. Father, we pray, oh God, for shoulder boss, brother, Wally, sister, Lai, it's all. Yes, sister, can we, every one of them, sister, now, woman, the whole family will pray for you all that the Lord will keep you. We pray that. God will keep the family stronger in the name of Jesus. He will give you all the fortitude to bear the Lord. The God will be Father. God will be the husband to mommy. He will be there for you. When the time for daddy, for, for the time for his need to come forward, God will be there. He will be a voice for you all in the name of Jesus. As you begin to make plans for the burial, the Lord will direct you. The Lord will keep you. He will keep the family stronger in the name of Jesus. And above all, he will provide. He will make provisions where you least expect in the name of Jesus. Thank you, our Father, for your answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. God bless you, sir. I don't want to shake you too much. I see God the Father. But don't worry. Don't worry. It is well. Uh, people that are still their father, don't worry, sir. I forgive you. Amen. On the 28th of this month, on the 28th of this month, many of us have always been blessed by Pastor Charles' ministration. Did you know that the, without the man in Pastor Charles' life, he would not have been blessed to be ministering like this? His father in the Lord is coming. He's already in London. Hallelujah. Yes, that goes out together. Pastor Charles, we have you talk on the altar. In fact, I'm jealous at times. My pastor, my pastor. Ah, I hope people can go and talk about my pastor too. I celebrate you, sir. The, the father with the Lord, the pastor that groomed him for many, how many years have we in the ministry? 20 years. The man is coming here. It will be a blessing to us on the 28th of this month. Because I didn't tell you before, most of them, we have fathers like that. They are called. We want to take them, I think Saturday and Sunday, but because I didn't tell you before, next time we have fathers, Pastor Moses, we have a father, and know his father, definitely. His business is too small to have Bishop David Abiyoye, but never mind, they will all come, and we will make sure we soak, we get as much from them. Hallelujah. So come on the 28th of the month, he will be ministering here. Are you looking forward to seeing him? Oh, God bless you. Sister, I'm going to quickly, I think my time is fast, as you're packing, quick, quick, quick. 
We all know our announcement is on the line, but we will not be able to talk about the announcement much today. Come on, darling. Let us welcome everybody, anybody worshiping with us for the first time. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So we'll just run through the announcements very, very quickly. Um, so we have, as usual, we have our prayer section every Sunday, and that's from 10.30 to 11 a.m. Every Sunday morning, we have our actual and virtual Sunday service from 11 to 1 p.m. Every Sunday evening, apologies, we also have our first Sundays of the month. So that's every first Sunday, and this is from 11 to 1.30 Every Sunday evening, we have a prayer hour um, slash Bible study, and this is a virtual service only from 8 to 9 p.m. Every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evening is another prayer service um, and Bible study hour. Again, this is a virtual service from 8 to 9 p.m. Every Monday midnight is the Yoruba prayer vigil, and this is from 12 a.m. to 1.15 Every Wednesday, we have Trek Prayer Day, and these services are all virtual. So we have the first one, which is the individual prayer hour from, three to, from 12 noon to 1.30 p.m. We have the children and family prayer hour, and this is from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. And finally, we have the midweek service from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Every Thursday afternoon, we have the weekly children service. This is a virtual service also from 12 to 1.30 p.m. Every Friday midnight, we have the English prayer vigil, O oh Lord, settle it tonight. And this is from 12 a.m. to 1.15 a.m. And this is also a virtual service. Every third Thursday of the month, we have the monthly special Shiloh and 1,000 Hallelujah Praise. And this is an actual service from 12 to 2 p.m. Every last Friday of the month, we have the Trek Church monthly vigil. And this is from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. And this is an actual service also. And finally, every first, second, third of every month, we have the Trek Covenant Fasting and Prayer Day. Amen. I ran through that very quickly, but I'm sure I usually give it to you in depth on usual Sundays, but because of the time, um, I'm just going to run through it. And also, just to bring our awareness again, we have the welfare boxes at the entrance of the church. If there's anything that anyone needs, please kindly drop a note, and the welfare team will be able to organize something to your house discreetly. Um, and finally, do we have any new members joining us in church today? Ooh. Hallelujah! Ah, lovely! Oh, 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 oh. So, yeah, may I ask you to just share your name in the chat? Good afternoon. My name is Adimola. Thank you so, so much. We have a bit of a tradition in the church. I know it's not going to take us too long. But because you're, you are our guest of honor, we will ask you to remain on your seat whilst everyone else rises up and welcome Brother Adimola into the church. Amen. Can I ask every member of Trek to rise up? Amen. Thank you and greet Brother Adimola. <laughs>
faith in this same location where you think that was nothing, God will make you cast multiples in the name of Jesus. The Lord commanded fishes, eat of fish, eat of bitter snakes. I pray for you the blessings of God. The Lord will command it to your life in the name of Jesus. Yes, yes, he said the giving last night that was nothing, but according to the word, I would, I, would, I would let it down. He let the nets down for a job, and the Bible says that he got many in the name of Jesus. I declare today and beyond that the Lord will favor us in the name of Jesus. Your efforts will yield fruit fulfilled in the name of Jesus. I say multiple fruits in the name of Jesus. I pray for you that your land and my land will never be barren. Somebody say my land will not be barren. Somebody say my land will not be barren. It will yield multiple fruits in the name of Jesus. In the same place, the Lord will favor us. In the same year, we shall, we shall receive more from God in the name of Jesus. As you go out this way, the blessings of God that came out before, He comes us in the name of Jesus. The Lord will make His face to shine upon us. He will give us uncommon blessings in the name of Jesus. Manifest in higher platform in Jesus mighty name. We are prayed and the church of God says amen, amen, and amen. Let's share the grace of God and fellowship. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life and we will join the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God's world 2024 is our year of multiple celebrations and of common testimonies. Is our year of great grace, greater blessings, and unusual manifestations. In this year 2024, the Lord shall anoint us with the oil of gladness and shall fill us uh, with the spirit of favor, concern, and mind, uh, and power. We shall excel exceedingly this year, and nothing shall stop us in the name of Jesus. Uh, as a redeemed child of God, I if we shape, I shall enter the city of peace and rest for no signs. Yes, sir. Uh, congratulations are in order for me and my family. I declare that the glory, majesty, and strength of God shall be evidence in my life. In Jesus' mighty and wonderful name, amen. Look at that person's eye and declare to that person the name of the, the motto of the ministry. Wow. Say it again, look at another person high and say the motto of the ministry. Wow. Look at the top person high. I go high, I go high. The motto of the ministry. Wow. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless.